Would you give up everything to bring the world information that seems out of this world and possibly crazy? Today we have award-winning reporter, lecturer, and author Ralph Blumenthal bringing us the life of Dr. John Mack. Some may know that Dr. John Mack risked his career to tell the stories of 200 men and women that encountered aliens. Ralph, in his latest book, The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and the Passion of John Mack, will bring us the stories and his research of Dr. John Mack. I'm Tony Sweet with Truth Be Told. Please welcome to the Truth Be Told studio, the one and only Ralph Blumenthal. <laughs> oh, that's a great intro for me. Thank you. Hey, Ralph. How you doing? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm very excited because uh, a lot of us were we were thinking in May we were going to get you on, and then there was you know this pre-Mercury retrograde. It just communication got screwed up. So apologize for that, but I'm glad you're here. Glad to be here. Thank you. Well, well, first of all, you know. Contact in the Desert's coming up. This is something that we we both I've I've participated in for for far as I back I can remember, and it's it's a it's a great way for people like ourselves to come together and share our stories, and and experiences and you know research. And one thing that you're bringing to the table that somebody that doesn't get to come to contact is John Mack because he's no longer with us. Um. And before we get into his story, I want to get into your story. I, I like to find out, you know, I've had, I've seen a UFO with my family, and a lot of people get inspired by, you know, their own encounters. Um, what's your story? What what got you involved in wanting to, you know, look into the research of John Mack? And did you have your own encounter at one time? Uh, alas, um, or happily, depending on how you want to look at it, I have never been abducted. Uh, I am pure like John Mack was pure. And he also regretted, in a way, um, not having any, any encounters of his own, uh, although he later reflected that it was probably good in a way because he could uh, speak as, uh, in, as an impartial observer, as an outsider. Right. He was not, you know... Uh, trying to validate some experience he had. So either way, it wasn't my choice. Right. <laughs> it wasn't his choice. <laughs> so um, I, I am not a, an abductee or an experiencer. Um, I was a follower of science fiction growing up. It was a big deal after the war, reading Ray Bradbury, Isaac Asimov, you know, right. vo exotic voyages to <laughs> Mars, you know, the moon. Right. Uh, it sounded so far-fetched. Um, but then um, I had a whole career in journalism, very earthbound, uh, you know, um, interests, uh, investigating the mafia and uh, uh, writing about law enforcement, right. and Nazi war criminals and stuff like that. Nothing to do with aliens. Um, but I got interested in John Mack when I was a correspondent in Texas for The New York Times, and I picked up a copy of his second book, Passport to the Cosmos. And I was amazed to read that a Harvard psychiatrist, you know, with an esteemed career, mm -hmm. was interested in, in investigating uh, alien encounters. Um, so I thought, gee, it'd make a great story for the Times. I didn't realize that he had already been written up in the Times. He was already very famous. <laughs> he'd been on Oprah. He'd written two books. Um, and then I pick up the paper a few days later and find that he's been run over and killed in London. Mm. He was there for a conference on Lawrence of Arabia. He had written a, a biography that won the Pulitzer Prize uh, years before. And uh, so he was no longer with us, but I decided to look into his career. I got access to his archives, uh, which his family gave me um, full, full access without any preconditions. Mm. And, and that was it. So that's how I got interested. So... First of all, they said they gave you full access, but how was that? How was that first conversation? Because I'm sure they were very particular who they gave that information to. Um, how, what was what was your convincing words to say? I, I really want to do a story and do a story justice, because you know a lot of people want to spin it different directions. Um, well, the New York Times helped. <laughs> well, true. That is true. <laughs> Uh, because it showed right away that I was serious, and uh, I had a track record. I had written, you know, books before, not on, 
you know, alien abduction or UFOs, but I had a track record of writing nonfiction. Right. And, uh, you know, this is what journalists do. They convince people to, uh, to help them. Um, and it wasn't, you know, instant. They thought it over. They, I, I contacted them when they were still grieving about his, mm. uh, his death. Um, it, took, it took quite a while. But um, I think they realized that it was a good match, that I would right. deliver, you know, a book uh, that I promised um, and uh, that I was a serious, you know, journalist. So uh, I think that helped. So what was the first, I mean, I mean as a journalist, I'm, I've never written a book. I've never really pretty much written an article in anything. But where do you start with his story? And how do you, because we've, like you said, he's already been out there and he's already written books. How do you start his story to bring a new kind of light to, to it? That is a good question. Um, and that is actually one of the things I'll be talking about at Contact in the Desert. I'm going to do a workshop on <laughs> the writing of, of my book, The Believer, in addition to the story of John Mack, which I'll be talking about um, as a kind of a lecture. I want to talk uh, as an author to fellow authors, because um, the question you asked is the first question that, uh, you know, people who want to write a book ask, how do you how do you start? Right. And the answer is, <laughs> it's very difficult. Um, because you, there's no natural starting point of any book. And by the way, one of the things I'm going to point out is that you don't choose a book. The book chooses you. Uh, <laughs> the topic sort of grabs you before you intellectually decide uh, you're going to write about this. Because if it's an, an intellectual decision on your part, it's not going to be a very good book. Right. It has to be something that uh, really grabs you. So the cosmos reached out, you could say, and, and <laughs> grabbed me on this when I picked up, you know, John Mack's book and I got, uh, I got abducted by the, by the subject. <laughs> That's um, a good way to put it. <laughs> so, you know, how do you start? Well, I got the, uh, all of his archives were, were huge, as you can imagine. I mean, oh, he, sure. he, he was killed at almost 75 years old. He'd spent his entire career in psychiatry He'd written books on nightmares and the Holocaust and suicide and all kinds. And Lawrence of Arabia, I said, it won the Pulitzer Prize. So there was a tremendous amount of material. Plus um, his own um, uh, therapy sessions, which he taped, where he talked about his own life and his own problems, mm -hmm. which he had. Um, and um, some of the um, sessions he had with uh, experiencers, abductees, which really um, were off the table. Uh, but so many of them came out on their own afterwards hmm. um, and appeared with John Mack that I got access to some of his, his work with these people as well. So the, the big problem was organizing the material. And how do you jump into a, you know, a, a fast flowing river? Right. Like that? <laughs> um, Carefully, <laughs> very <Right>. carefully. <laughs> um, and believe me, this went through many, many drafts. What I thought was this, you know, uh, one good way to begin it, it turned out not to be. And I'd go back and redo it and redo that and, you know, cut it back. I mean, the, the, the thing that every author goes through, uh, it's it's a really a uh, wrenching process. Um, you know, people pick up a book and think, oh, the author just, you know, wrote it this way. Well, that, what you're seeing is the end product. Um Anyway, I don't want to, you know, weep and moan about my problems <laughs> writing this book. I spent 16 years at it, so it was a long time. But what you might be interested in, Tony, is that I decided to start the book with a conference at MIT in 1992 hmm. uh, that John Mack co-sponsored. And it brought together atomic scientists and folklorists and um, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, religion scholars, because they're all trying to figure out what this uh, abduction phenomenon was really about. It, it was and remains a complete mystery. It, it mm -hmm. does. Yep. Um, there's a spoiler alert that I don't solve. <laughs> I don't solve the mystery in this book. Uh, if you're looking for the answer, don't buy this book. Right. <laughs> um, if you're looking for a process that, you know, takes you along the, the path, uh, yes. But anyway, this conference was really important. It produced a... Um, a, a thick volume of papers that were released two years later, um, uh, where all these scholars and experts thought, you know, uh, uh, waxed eloquent on what, what they thought the phenomenon was. Hmm. 
And I, that's why I decided to start the book that way. And uh, um, I, as a kind of a teaser, and then I right. go back to his life, and then I return to the conference later. Do you feel like, you know, I've worked with a lot of psychics and mediums and intu intuitives. Do you feel that cosmically, universally, that this came to you for a reason to continue his work? Uh, because you don't hear a lot of other people put, I mean, I'm sure there are, but other people that get notoriety and exposure as you have, you know, talking about John Mack's work. Well, I think everything happens for a reason. I really do. I thought that before this book, um, I've been very fortunate in my life. Right. I've been blessed. Uh, and um, I think, uh, you know, like John Mack uh, realized, um, that there is something more to the universe than the reality, the everyday reality we see around us, um, that there's certain things that we don't understand yet, that physics has yet to, uh, you know, discover. Uh, so, uh, yes, I, I believe things happen for a reason, and there was a reason that um, I, w I was put on this earth, and right. I, the work I did at the New York Times, I, I hope, uh, justifies some of, you know, the effort I put into uh, my life and things I hope I illuminated and made better by exposing, you know, that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, to answer your question. Yeah. So when, when, uh, when you first got, well, first of all, let's, let's just give a short little description of who John Mack was for the people out there. They're going, okay, you're talking about John Mack, but who in the heck is this guy? Right. Right. <laughs> so John Mack, uh, grew up in a, uh, uh, rather wealthy German Jewish home. Uh, his father was a professor at City College, by the way, where I was a student at the time, although I didn't know, you know, I, I knew who Ed Mack, the father, was, but I didn't have any courses with him. I didn't know our paths would cross, you know, so many years later. Right. Uh, anyway, his father was a professor. His his mother died when he was eight and a half months old oh, of wow. appendicitis, which was very traumatic for him and really figures in, in, in the book I wrote because he was searching his whole life for his missing mother. And that probably motivated him in some way to, you know, to go on the mission that he, he went on. Um, and then he had a, he, his father remarried, he had a stepmother who was also a professor, kind of exacting, and the usual stepmother problems that he had. Um, anyway, he, um, he, uh, he uh, went to the movies one night and saw Lawrence of Arabia and decided he was going to write up this amazing character. Um, and spent uh, a dozen years in England and the Middle East uh, writing this book that won the Pulitzer Prize. And then that made him suddenly an expert in the Middle East. And he traveled, uh, you know, to uh, Israel and the, uh, the territories trying to make peace between the Arabs and the Israelis. And we know how that went. <laughs> <laughs> but he tried. He met with Yasser Arafat. And then he got very involved in the... Um, movement to ban nuclear weapons because he was a doctor and he, he thought the biggest threat to humanity was nuclear weapons. So he, he went out to Nevada and protested the nuclear test site and got arrested with his family. So all this was very earthbound, uh, you know, earthbound causes until he went out to Esalen in the late 80s and he got involved in something called holotropic breathing, which was a breathing discipline that helped you change your level of consciousness uh, without drugs, which he had also tried, uh, like LSD, but he was interested in, um, in, in breathing and relaxation techniques. And that opened him up to a whole other world of, um, you know, what's not within our senses, what's out there. And then when somebody told him that Bud Hopkins, this artist, was uh, investigating alien encounters, um, he ended up meeting Bud Hopkins through a whole series of steps I outlined in the book. He was reluctant at first, but when he met Bud Hopkins, he thought Bud Hopkins was probably crazy, and the people <laughs> who came to him with the stories were probably crazy. But um, he quickly uh, realized that these people were not crazy, that something happened to them that could not easily be explained, and he started uh, investigating their stories, and, and that's what got him going. And then Harvard... Uh, you know, uh, wasn't very happy with that. Eventually, they subjected him to an investigation, um, which he overcame with no discipline. Um, so that's John Mack in a nutshell. And what, when John Mack, and he started, you know, did these cases, um, 
how did he choose when you're doing your research? How did he choose the cases that he uh, shared with the public? Um, well, uh, you know, it wasn't that easy to find people. Because, right, I'm sure back uh, then, especially. <laughs> yeah, you know, the the, uh, the so-called skeptics, uh, you know, are very glib to say, "Oh, these people are publicity seekers." You know, they want to tell their story. They don't want to tell their story. Uh, by and large, they're ashamed, although they have nothing to be ashamed of. But they they cannot believe these outlandish things have have happened to them. Um, and uh, so they're very reluctant to tell their stories. So it wasn't easy to, to, to find all these people. Eventually, they made their way to John Mack because mm -hmm. he became you know, famous for his research. Um, so um, he settled in the in the uh, in his first book, he settled on 13 case studies. Mm -hmm. He interviewed many, many more people, but right. he had 13 stories which are amazing, amazing. And again, I would fault the, the, the so-called skeptics and the debunkers for not doing their homework because uh, you can be a skeptic and you know you can um, contradict you can you know dispute some mm -hmm. of these you know encounter stories right. but you got to know what the hell they are in the first <laughs> place um, so it's not enough to say oh this is a nightmare well they don't always happen at night and John Max studied nightmares and he knew what nightmares were so these were not by and large nightmares. Um, because a lot of them happen in the daytime. People right. are driving their cars. Uh, they're walking in the woods, you know. Uh, um, and um, so um, uh, I, I got off on a train of thought here, but that's uh, right. Miami, your question was uh, how, uh, well, how did, like, how did he, or what, well, how, how did he, he choose the cases to share? The, yeah. Well, the, a lot of the, the people came to him. Um, they over they they had bad experiences with other psychiatrists who right. told them to take you know take medication or that they were demented or that they were just imagining this. Right. So they eventually heard about him and they gravitated to him. Um, he had many more cases than he than he wrote up publicly. Um, hundreds of cases of people, including by the way, young children. Oh, really? Years old, um, who said things like. Uh, you know, I fly in the sky, little man takes me up in the sky. <laughs> uh, so these kids are not, you know, reciting the books they've read. Right, the right. They're two years old, three years old, they can barely talk. Um, so that's one of the things that, that really interested John Mack. Um, uh, but he, uh, he, 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 he sorted through these cases and figured out, you know, he had people too, who he didn't trust, who came to him. Uh, he, he, thought some of their stories a little funny. There was one case that, that hoaxed him. Oh, really? A woman, a woman came forward with a phony story. Uh, uh, was this like on purpose much. or like a journalist or somebody on that... Purpose. On purpose. And I hmm. talk about this in my book. Uh, she uh, wanted to expose him for some reason that was uh. never really clear. She thought he was a cult leader and she made up a story. And the, the, the peculiar thing is, as I show in my book, um, she probably was an experiencer because she told other people stories that made them believe, not just John Mack, that she really had experiences um, of her own. But uh, the one story she told John Mack was, was fabricated, and uh, he didn't really commit himself, but he, he thought it was interesting enough. And uh, Time Magazine then used that to, to beat him up, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that really hurt him. Uh, so you ask how he chose his cases. Um, that was one case where he was a little naive. I'm sure. Uh, he had to be open to people. You know, that was part of the problem. In order to get them to open up to him, he had to convince them that he was interested in their stories. Um, and his, his enemies used that to say, well, he encouraged them. He made them believe that, that, that their experiences were real. <laughs> And he bought into their experiences. It was really a, a subtle line. Um, he had to convince them that he was interested enough that they could open up to him without, um, you know, feeding into uh, their own ideas. He had to let their ideas be their ideas. Uh, he couldn't shape or um, create. He said at times he was co-creating. Hmm these experiences, which was a very unfortunate 
phrase that again came came back to to haunt him. But generally, I think he he kept that line between uh, you know being supportive and and letting them tell their stories. I guess I mean again as a psychiatrist and when you're dealing with and what year was this? Um, well, he got into it in the end of 1990. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I'm sorry, January uh, 1990 is when he first heard about it from Bud Hopkins. Mm-hmm. Uh, so within a year or two, he was already deep into it. So, I mean, even in early 1990s, I mean, if it's 70s, 80s, even 90s, when people talked about UFOs, people always kind of looked at you a little funny anyway. Um and then when you bring up abduction, then it's, you know, that was a whole different story. Um, I'm, I'm curious to, to how he found his first person to talk about that and how, how was he at first, skept, not skeptical, but cautious of sharing that to where other people finally heard about him and then started coming to him on their own. But that how was that first did you get to read that first case of his that where how his thoughts of what this person was going through well um i it's hard to isolate it to to an exact moment when he you know got his first case i know one of the first people um he met was a young man he called scott in his book who later came out under his real name uh randy nickerson Mm -hmm. who actually did a film on one of the um, strangest uh, um, encounter cases of all, which took place at a school in, in Zimbabwe, uh, Southern Africa, where school children saw a, a landing and uh, two, two beings, um, 60 kids. And, and Randy w- made a film about it, um, which should be out at some point, a very interesting film. Anyway, so he was one of the first people. There was another a fellow that John Mack brought to, to the Oprah show, um, Peter Faust, who also came out under his real name, who was a hotel manager. And these people were very brave, by the way. Right. Uh, because Randy and, and Peter did go on these shows with John Mack. Um, you know, John very quickly realized that these people were not crazy. Um, they were not making it up. Um, they were not looking for publicity. Uh, he started to eliminate all the things that people who don't know really quickly throw out as you know their answer to what right. this phenomenon is. Because I don't know what it is. And John <laughs> Mack never found out what it is. It's a mystery, it remains a mystery. But he was able to eliminate certain things. So the people he uh, he started seeing, including these people I mentioned to you, and there was a woman named Julia, uh, who he brought out to, at Harvard at a, at a very early lecture he gave at Harvard. Um, that these people were completely normal, except for this experience. That's what made it so confounding, that there was nothing in their profiles mm-hmm. to suggest that they would be vulnerable to to this strange experience. It, it, it is not clear why. Uh, some some people had these experiences and other people like me don't right um it does seem to run in families by the way Uh, john and and others found out that if if you had an abduction experience um your your parents mother or father and grandparents probably did and your children probably did or will um that that really is one of the most terrifying aspects Mm -hmm. uh, you can't protect your own kids um if you've had a traumatic experience like this. Um, but anyway, he found no um, no profile of these people that would explain um, the experience, which is one of the many confounding aspects of it. Um, so um, he, he wasn't skeptical for long. I mean, he, right. uh, he immediately thought that uh, as soon as he saw these people and saw the way they recounted their experiences with suitable affect, which is the psychiatric term for, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the way they uh, describe events, you know, their, mm-hmm. their demeanor. It was very authentic. They would weep and cry and curse and 
you know, they, they weren't making it up. This is not the kind of thing. He's a psychiatrist. So he says, you know, I know when people are faking, these people are not faking. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but the, 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 the answer to your question, it's, it's, it's hard to know, you know, he never found out why certain people had these experiences and others didn't. So, I mean, we know that Harvard did not, they looked down on this. And how fast did they, because, I, I mean, if you tell a couple fac faculty members or something, and, you know, well, that's kind of interesting. But when did it get to the point where the upper Harvard faculty started looking down upon this and tried to put a stop to it? Or, I mean, what, tell us what happened. Uh, yeah, I'll and, give you a, a, a little timeline. So he heard about it the first time from Bud Hopkins in January 1990. Right. By December 91, which is less than two years later, he was already delivering his first lecture to Harvard. So he didn't oh, take wow. too long <laughs> to, to, think, to try to figure this thing out. You know, he was, he was an impetuous guy. Um, he was very charismatic, you know, tall, commanding, blue eyes, and super confident, brilliant as a professional, you know, as a psychiatrist. So he did not lack self-confidence. So, you know, within two years of finding out about this phenomenon, phenomenon for the first time and beginning to investigate it, he was already lecturing to Harvard about it. And they let him lecture. Um, there were a few uh, senior faculty members who said, don't be so confident, you know, um, but they, they left him alone. Hmm. Now, um, four years later, in 1994, after he, his, his book came out, his first book called Abduction, and he was on the Oprah show and a lot of other shows, and the New York Times wrote him up. That's when Harvard started to get a little skittish uh. and said, you know, um, we're going to convene and investigate. They call they called at one point an inquisition because they explained <laughs> to him, this is not an inquisition. So he's a psychiatrist. He says, well, why did they explain it in terms of what it isn't? I was going to say yeah. they, they wouldn't even have mentioned it. If <laughs> why did they even mention it? Right. So I, I say, yeah, it was kind of an inquisition because it inquired into his frame of mind, uh, his methods, his finances. It was quite intrusive. Um, you know, did he believe in UFOs? All these things. Uh, so, um, it, so it took four years for Harvard to really crack down on him. And then um, the investigation was secret because um, it was a personnel matter. Uh, mm. you know, um, and they didn't want, I mean, to their credit, they didn't want to tarnish him with a public inquiry. Um, but uh, I'm, I think I'm the only one in my book who has the full story of this uh, investigation because it, Harvard never uh, made it public officially. They never came out with um, a, a report. I pieced it together from uh, reports that they that the uh, committee, the investigating committee, made for for the dean, and that they furnished to to John and his lawyers. So I have the account, you know, pieced together from emails and and legal memos, et cetera. By the way, he had two crackerjack lawyers. Uh, he had Danny Sheehan, um, who um, uh, had investigated the Ku Klux Klan and Karen Silkwood case and uh, Iran-Contra, the arms scandal under the Reagan administration. And then he had uh, Eric McLeish, who uh, really is credited with uh, uh, investigating the priest scandal, the priest abuse scandal in Boston, right at the same time. He, he just uh, you know, started that when he started working for John Mack. So Mack had super lawyers and they, they held Harvard's feet to the fire. Um, and they made Harvard, you know, uh, uh, forced Harvard to try to, you know, come up with something substantial against them, which they never could do really. Well, we're going to take a quick break. We got we to gotta promote our, I can't believe it's only a week away, uh, contact in the desert. Uh, the 25th through the 28th, only a week from today. And uh, Ralph Blumenthal is going to be there, and he's going to be doing a lecture and a workshop. When we come back, I'm going to ask if uh, Ralph actually got to meet or speak with any of his former patients. So uh, don't go anywhere. I'm Tony Sweet with Truth Be Told, and get your questions ready in the chat room. When you start to ask the question, it unfolds. 
the fabric of space itself, how it's made, what is it made of? We're not alone in this universe. We never have been. Alien intelligences have cohabited with us on this planet for millions of years. We inherited the obsession from the Anunnaki. Anyone that still thinks that we're the ones that are obsessed with gold does not know enough about the true history of our species, how we came to be here, and the conditions that brought us here. We are not unique in this universe. Extraterrestrials do exist. We are, so to say, the copies of them. All right, we're back. I'm Tony Sweet with uh, Ralph uh, Blumenthal. And next week is going to be Contact in the Desert. Yes, it is online. It's virtual this year. But you should get your tickets today because they're going to go out fast. And uh, we hope... Uh, you all enjoy next week's speakers. I mean, there's tons of them. If uh, let me just see if I, I think I have a picture. And there's just a few. Not only Ralph, but you know George Norrie, Nick Pope, Linda Moulton Howe. The list goes on and on and on. And uh, Ralph, you're going to be there, and we're, you're going to be de getting more in depth on what we're talking about today. And uh, I mean, how, what are you going to be showing? Are you going to do some presentations, pictures? I mean, what's what's going to what are you going to show? Yeah, I'm basically going to be talking about John Mack. I gave you, you know, sort of the flavor of it. Right. Uh, a lot of the people there will know who John Mack, right. you know, was. But um, uh, hopefully I'll tell some stories people haven't heard before and talk about his life and how he really pointed the way um, very courageously for a Harvard psychiatrist to, to take on a subject like this. And then um, uh, that'll be called In the Footsteps of John Mack. And then I'll be doing um, a workshop called, um, um, well, I, I forgot what the lecture might be called, Impossible Yet True. Uh, uh, how, yeah. You know, the, the, the quote, abduction of John Mack, because he was never abducted, but he was abducted by the, uh, the topic. Right. Uh, which is the point I want to make. Um, and the workshop I, is in the footsteps of John Mack. Okay, that's the workshop. <laughs> uh, and the other is impossibly yet true. I forgot yes. which was which. But anyway, um, the idea in the workshop would be to talk about it as an author approaching the subject and how do you get your arms around a thing like this, especially for a New York Times reporter um, who spent his whole career, right. you know, investigating very, uh, you know, earthbound subjects. Uh, <laughs> suddenly I'm you know, off on UFOs and alien abduction. But it's the same process, you know, you collect the facts, you stay out of the way, let the facts speak for themselves and, and tell the story. So I'm really looking forward to this conference, even though it is unfortunately virtual, there will be a live Q&A. Oh, that's so great. To ask questions and I can respond. I love it. I love that, that uh, I, we were talking that, you know, it's, I, I'm a person, I like to feed off the crowd. I like the, I like the live aspect. I love to see face to face, to face with people. And I'm sure you do too, uh, especially the enthusiasm of people that earn the same same right of mind as you. You know, UFOs and aliens and all that good stuff. So, so get your tickets. Uh, the the lectures included in the in the past, but the workshop is additional. But it's going to be well worth it. Uh, like I said, there's going to be stories that he's going to tell that you won't get to hear here. Uh, and other, I'm sure, other interviews that he's been on. But um, well, I, I'm curious. You had access to, you know, through his family, his, his, the case files and stuff, but did you ever get a chance to speak with some of his patients? I did. Um, uh, actually, uh, quite a few of them. Um, oh, great. Um, and, uh, and, and some people who didn't actually see John Mack. By the way, he couldn't, no, nobody could ever decide whether these were patients or subjects <laughs> because uh, a patient really has something wrong with him. Right, uh, right. And John said, there's nothing wrong with these people except that they had this traumatic experience. So it's not like they were suffering, you know, uh, some ailment. Um, um, so they're not really patients. And, uh, and he was also researching the cases. So in a way, they were research subjects, um, but they were a little of both. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one uh, good example is um, 
uh, a woman who's uh, known to us now as Linda Napolitano, uh, who was the subject of a whole book by Bud Hopkins called Witness, because uh, she was seen by some witnesses um, levitating or, or, or being flown out of her 11th floor oh window over the Brooklyn Bridge by three beings into a spacecraft that flew off and plunged into the East River. Um, and this happened, I believe, in 1989, according to, you know, the, the story that Bud Hopkins told. So I had the chance to interview her about her experience. Um, she's a, a very otherwise normal person uh, with, <laughs> with a great story and uh, able to tell it herself very lucidly. Um, and uh, it, it's a famous case, probably one of the most famous cases in, in ufology or the annals of alien encounters. Um, the one thing, the problem with the case was that Bud Hopkins never could identify the two witnesses who came forward in the first place, hmm. um, uh, security guards, apparently for a VIP, uh, who was later identified as uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Javier oh, wow. Perez de Cuellar who supposedly witnessed this as well. He died just last year at 100 um, and, and never really talked about it, right. although he was offered the chance. Um, but anyway, I've talked to Linda at great length um, and Randy Nickerson, who was one of uh, you know John's uh, first uh, um, um, you know, experiencers and, and a whole bunch of others, uh, Karen Austin, who... Uh, um, joined up with John later in his life and helped him run his household mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, became very outspoken. Uh, she uh, reached out to Lawrence Rockefeller, you know, oh, wow. who was a great benefactor of right. John Mack, um, one of the billionaires who supported his research along with uh, um, Robert Bigelow. Um so, uh, yeah, I mean, I did get to meet them myself and ask them my own questions and determine, although I'm not a psychiatrist, that they seemed eminently sane. <laughs> and except for what happened, you know, to, except what they remembered happened to them, let's put it that way, uh, they were completely ordinary. Was there any the, that um, from the time that John Mack uh, uh, interviewed them, we'll say interviewed them, uh, as a, a, a study case to the time that you spoke to them, did they have any new abductions or new encounters that after his passing? Absolutely. Oh, really? Uh, many of them uh, continued to wow. have uh, experiences. Uh, it's not the kind of thing. I mean, it, it did it did come in in, in certain irregular <laughs> patterns, and you know, right. each case is a little bit different. Right. But many of the people I spoke to and people who John Mack. Uh, didn't uh, work with because they came along much later, more recently, um, uh, tell me they continue to have experiences. And um, uh, they never know really when they're coming. They, they might drop off for, you know, a few weeks or months, and then they come back. And, um, and by the way, one of the things that John Mack found so interesting is that while there was a general consistency to these stories they had a, it was a basic you know abduction story beings would have you know they'd see a spacecraft beings would appear they'd find themselves people would find themselves in a spacecraft uh for different uh, you know medical procedures pseudo medical procedures reproductive exper mm -hmm. ex 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 procedures experiments uh, eggs would be taken from women or sperm from men and then they would be re-abducted later and see their hybrid offspring you know that was sort mm -hmm. of a common theme but the stories were really, within that, uh, very often very different. And some didn't involve spacecraft at all. Oh, really? Some just involved, you know, strange beings. Um, uh, Carrie Mullis, a, a Nobel Prize winning chemist who wrote a book, he died just about two years ago, very eminent figure in science, had an encounter with a, um, a raccoon that spoke to him. <laughs> You know, wow. no, no spacecraft, no aliens, just this raccoon. And then he, he, he found himself on the road, you know, the next morning, and he didn't know how he got there. So the, the experiences are really, they run a gamut. And um, uh, it, it's really very, very strange. The more I looked into it, the more John Mack studied it, um, it was very hard to characterize and, it, and very hard to 
um, you know, jump to a conclusion and say, well, this is clearly this or that. Right. Uh, so uh, it's fascinating. Well, it sounds like with the raccoon, that sounds like Garden of the Galaxy. <laughs> Garden. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, well, I, I'm curious, was there a main theme? I know, you know, abductions, but was there a main theme of people saying, okay, I've been uh, uh, abducted, but they told me about the future. They told me why I was abducted. Did they have a, an enhancement in intuition? Did they? What was the changes that they saw spiritually and mentally, not just physically? Well, uh, John Mack, by the way, was sort of unique among um, the researchers in this field uh, in that he, his people, the people he Gardeners. worked with, told him that they had experienced some spiritual growth uh, as a result of these experiences. And other researchers, notably Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs, who was a uh, historian who did some very interesting work with his own circle of experiences, had a rather different take on this. Hopkins and Jacobs um, did not get the same impression that there was this um, uh, growth, uh, spiritual growth involved. Hmm. But in John Mack's case, people told him that they emerged with greater concern for the fate of the planet, uh, worry about uh, the pollu pollution of the planet, right. uh, nuclear war, the terrible things that are going on uh, on Earth and um, a feeling of, of love sometimes for these beings and attachment to them, a feeling of love for this uh, spirit of the, of the cosmos, this, this permeating uh, benevolence of the cosmos. Um, so uh, this sort of um, uh, tempered the, the trauma of the experience, which was undeniably traumatic. Right, I'm sure. Be, you know, to be taken... Uh, you know, immobilized and to feel powerless and see these, you know, beings uh, of, of various types, not just the so-called greys, but taller figures and reptilians and, you know, a, a whole slew of races, according to some of these people. <laughs> it's not just one kind of being. Anyway, uh, that, that is scary. Yeah, and, it would be. So in addition to that, these, as I said, these people felt that they had come away with something and it was not just a, a, a terrifying experience. It was, uh, it was moderated by this insight uh, that, that they felt they had gotten. Was there any feedback or resistance from the U.S. government towards John Mack at that time, or have you had any, you know, contact with? Because there's a lot of, you know, a lot of information coming out now with the U.S. government intelligence agencies about UFOs. I mean, have you had any uh, encounters, or did John Mack have any encounters with the U.S. government? John Mack did not. Uh, he was asked about that specifically, and it, it might be sort of counterintuitive. Again, we stick right. to facts. Uh, you know, uh, people who love to dabble in conspiracies, right. you know, yeah, right. much prefer to hear that John Mack was abducted by my lab, you know, the military <laughs> uh, abduction arm of the government or whatever, you know, the way the stories go and subject to, you know, mind altering torture, not true uh, in his account. He was asked about it. He said the government never uh, contacted him in any way, uh, never obstructed his work, which is interesting uh, because it's a fact right. that we, we, we deal with. Um, neither have I. Um, in my work at the New York Times, I have reached out to many government people. Um, I, I didn't always get the information I wanted. Very often I didn't. Um, but we at the Times developed some, some good sources who eventually were all on the record. We didn't use any you know, deep background, mm -hmm. uh, uh, unidentified sources in our stories. And it was pretty straightforward. Uh, they told us what, what they could. Uh, what they could. Some stuff was classified, yeah. uh, which we were never able to find out about, such as uh, um, recovered materials from crashed spacecraft, supposedly, which there are a lot of stories about, but we were never able to really nail it down. Uh, that's probably one of the biggest uh, outstanding mysteries uh, with, with UFOs. Does the government possess you know, materials, and mm -hmm. are they using it? them to reverse engineer, uh, you know, uh, defense equipment, et cetera. Um, we don't know. Uh, 
Um, but to answer your question, no, I've never been interfered with by the government. They've never tried to plant disinformation on me. Right. Um, what I did find, by the way, is interesting that we came across some documents that seemed highly interesting uh, about uh, uh, crashes. Oh, really? Uh, but um, it was not clear that the documents were completely authentic, that they may have been um, uh, ta tampered with or, or adjusted to, to be partly true and partly fake. Uh, they were tainted in some way, we, we concluded, and uh, to the point where we couldn't rely on them. Right. So the government uh, has a long history of you know, putting out disinformation. Right, uh, right. And, to throw you off uh, the scent. Yeah, throw people off the scent, or or try to try to uh, uh, discredit people looking into this. They they try to say that early, you know, people studying U, you know, UFOs were communist uh, sympathizers. Right. Or, you know, <laughs> they try to question their loyalty and um, really terrible stuff. But uh, so it is interesting that docu in, in some particular cases, documents we thought we could rely on um, had some doubt about them. And in the end, if they have a doubt about them, we're not going to write about them or feature them because uh, we don't want to be caught, you know, right. for something that, that is yeah. in some way bogus. So anyway, uh, and, you know, the government may have tampered with these documents in order to, to see uh, where leaks are. Or oh, yeah, I'm sure. Throw adversaries off the trail. You know, maybe the Russians and the Chinese were working on stuff. So we're going to feed them a fake document. Uh, so who knows? Well, we just have a few minutes left. I mean, this the book, The Believer, please purchase this book. Um, I'm, you can get it on Amazon. You can go to RalphLumenthal.com. But um, is there enough case studies or uh, other research of John Max to make another book, or is everything in this one? Well, I'd like to say everything is in this book. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, first of all, his, his archive is huge and voluminous. And it is not public yet. Uh, the family has not the John Mack Institute, let's say, which right. uh, with his legacy and the family uh, has not put these documents out yet for the for public uh, research. Um, when when they are put out, uh, I'm sure there's stuff there. I know there's stuff there that I haven't dealt with. Um, that would be very interesting to scholars. So I would welcome I'm not proprietary here. I don't want to say, nope, I'm the final word. And nobody else can write about John <laughs> Right, <Mack>. right. <laughs> uh, I welcome further research. Uh, um, so there is more material here. Um, I, I like to think I, I skimmed the most important parts and, you know, the, the main part of it. But he's a fascinating character. Um, what's not in, in my book or anywhere else, public uh, certainly, are the... Um, uh, the actual interviews he did with many of his experiencers. Now, oh, when great. they came out later, publicly, uh, that's public. Um, when they that's were on great. TV shows with him, that's public. Right. But when he interviewed people in, th in you know, therapy sessions or counseling mm -hmm. sessions, uh, th those are obviously confidential. And some of those people have never come out under their real names. So they would not be happy uh, <laughs> to know that uh, this material is, is out there. Um, even under a pseudonym, it's not out there. So uh, that material will, will probably always be confidential and probably should be. All right, last question. Very important question here. Going in as a journalist, you know, every, I've known a lot of my friends that were journalists, they go into like a story as a journalist, kind of mid-ground, believer, not believer. But after researching and studying his cases, were you a believer before? And if not, are you a believer now? Well, first of all, I like to say, and I really, I actually put this in the New York Times, that um, I don't like the term believer. I use it in the book because I say John Mack was a believer in earthly justice and right. being courageous and pursuing, you know, the question. But it's often used pejoratively, like you're gullible, you're just a believer. And um First of all, UFOs are not a question of belief. They, we now know they exist. Right. They are physical. They've been tracked by the Navy and radar mm -hmm. and imaging devices, and pilots have seen them. So, you know, you could ask, well, do you believe in the moon and the star? Do you believe <laughs> in, the, in the sun? Do you believe in the ocean? Right. So, you know, yeah, I believe in UFOs because it's not a question of belief. Uh, 
So that's one thing. Now, uh, again, alien abduction is such a complicated question. These um, accounts uh, by people who are otherwise eminently sane um, have no easy explanation. The obvious things are off the table. They're not crazy. They're not, you know, hallucinating. They're not making it up. They're not seeking publicity. Uh, you know, for all the reasons I said before, um, the obvious explanations don't don't compute. So, what's left? We don't know. It's it's a mystery. Um, hopefully, science can come to the rescue because. Mm -hmm. um, we, we investigate everything else. We, you know, we send radio signals up to, you know, the, through the cosmos right. to look for a response. We, uh, you know, uh, look for the, the dark matter and dark energy of the universe, 95% of which is a mystery. We look for hidden particles that make up, you know, the cosmos. Mm -hmm. we, we look for all kinds of things, spend billions of dollars. And this is what I end my book with, the story of how we spend all this money scientifically to try to get answers but we're not spending the same money to try to figure out what's going on with these people. Isn't that true? So <laughs> that's what we need to do. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know what the answer is, uh, but, but we need to keep looking for it. Well, Ralph, thank you so much. This has been great. And I've really enjoyed having you on the show and I can't wait to uh, next week uh, for your workshop and lecture. Uh, please come back. And we'd love to, I, there's other books I'd love to touch on because you've written so many and congratulations on a great career. Thank you, Tony. Real pleasure to be with you. Thanks you for having it. me. And uh, everybody, thank you for for joining us every Friday and supporting us, sharing our show, commenting. Um, we appreciate it. YouTube, subscribe, iHeart, Apple, all that. Subscribe, leave some positive comments. Those are always the best. And uh, until next time, I'm Tony Sweet with Truth Be Told. Don't go anywhere because I have another interview right after this. <laughs>